The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Don't ask kids what they want to be when they grow up. Ask them what problems they want to solve. That's advice from Canadian futurist Sinead Boval. She sits down with Nam Kiwanuka tonight on what's ahead for youth and tech. Then our Ontario Hubs breaks down the housing data dashboard that's helping Hamilton tackle homelessness. And from what's fueling a surge in sports gambling to Toronto's mayoral controversy, we've got the agenda's week in review. It's Friday, February 17th, and that's all ahead on the agenda. While many of us recently flocked to try out a new artificial intelligence app, some people pause to ask, where does this go now? A Canadian futurist who is founder and CEO of the tech education company Way has put a lot of thought into what's ahead. Her name is Sinead Bovell. She's on the United Nations Generation Connect Visionaries Board and a contributor to Wired Magazine. And Sinead Bovell joins us now. Hi. Hello. Thanks. It's such a pleasure to meet you in person. I've been following you on all the social media, so it's nice <laughs> to see you in person. You too, you as well. Uh, so you're a futurist. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean? I think the name sounds a lot more glamorous and mysterious than it is, but essentially tracking a lot of data points, both qualitative and quantitative, and using it to build forecasts uh, and future scenarios. So tracking things from emerging technologies to patents to who's a company hiring, and using that to kind of make forecasts about where we could be headed. So you mentioned for forecasts, not predictions. Absolutely not predictions. Yeah. That's an entirely different wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we seem to be um, living in what media is always saying, we're living in unprecedented times. And, and a lot of people, I think, are feeling maybe less optimistic than they have in the last little while. As a futurist, what makes you optimistic about the future? Right, so I think if we even just look at the trajectory of history, we have been improving in a lot of key metrics for humanity over time. Uh, but when we look out into the future, a lot of the problems that we face today, we have solutions for. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just about humans making the right decisions and, and steering our future in the right direction. But I think a lot of the, the key critical problems that we're facing today, we can solve them. Uh, we just have to make the choice to do so. And so that's what keeps me quite optimistic and knowing that the optimistic scenarios are very much possible. And I think um, I want to come back to the decisions because tech seems to be moving at a faster pace than ever before. And sometimes the decisions we make now might not be decisions we make 10 years from now, but we'll get back to that in a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, you also help millennials and Gen Z enter the tech space. What's the demand been like over the past few years? In terms of them stepping into the, mm -hmm. the workforce? Do they feel more empowered to be in that space? I think they feel a lot more comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. um, and especially for, for Gen Z, uh, technology has been a platform for them to use their voices. So I think their approach to it uh, is a lot more inspiring, a lot more encouraging, a lot, I'd say, a little bit more optimistic uh, than other generations. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're doing enough to educate people around it? Because I have uh, two small kids. And uh, over, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, they were online. And then before that, pediatrician said, no screens, no tech. and now it seems to be this little like push and pull. Um, we relied so much on technology during the pandemic for many different things. But then now it's like, oh, no, we can't. Um, so do you, do you think that we know, do you think that we're, we know enough to make the decisions that we need to make forward? Or do we just need more education around it? I think a lot more education around it. And I think uh, for starters, a lot of our uh, vision of what technology is is devices, uh, but technology is things like software as well, so artificial intelligence. So tech education really needs to include those types of concepts for, for children as well, so they're prepared. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just a matter of do we use iPads or do we not? Uh, should an AI be making this decision about us? Uh, or if an algorithm put this piece of information in front of us, can I think critically to know why it did that? Uh, those are the types of areas of tech education that I think are important, and I don't think we do enough of that. Um, you are Canadian, mm -hmm. but you work in the States. Uh, is, is it more challenging to enter the tech space here in Canada? 
In the last few years, I'd say no. I think Canada has really done a great job in opening technology as a lane mm -hmm. uh, and really helping some companies uh, form and, and build more of a sector here. Uh, prior to that, potentially, but uh, Canada is a strong, a strong player in the world of technology. Uh, I don't think we talk about it enough, but but we're playing a pretty big role. Well, you did um, uh, a tech talk uh, earlier this year, or well, last year mm -hmm. in 2022, and you shared this tech talk about digital avatars. Right. And I'm just going to tell the audience, just prepare to have your mind blown. We're going to show a clip of it. This is Shudu Graham. She's a striking South African model, likely on the path to a supermodel. Scroll through her Instagram. You can see all of the big campaigns she's landed. She's been featured in Vogue a few times, which is kind of like the Holy Grail. And she's also an activist. She uses her platform as a rising black supermodel to call for more diversity in fashion. And I think that's incredibly admirable. There's another fact about Shudu. She isn't real. Okay, um, what? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so Shudu is part of uh, an emerging field of digitally generated people, so digital avatars. She isn't powered by AI, she's a digital construction, uh, but she books campaigns. She's been featured in Vogue quite a few times, and avatars and AI as digital humans will play a role in our future. Fashion modeling, uh, spokespeople, news anchors, we'll, we'll start to see them kind of creep into to more and more industries. You said news anchors and I started getting a little hot under the collar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every, every industry is gonna have to prepare for the future of work. Uh, and I think it seems a little bit shocking to see an AI or an avatar in the world of fashion modeling because we previously believed jobs that were more in creative industries were immune to technology. Uh, but I don't think any, any lane really is. Okay, but let's unpack this a little bit because um, in the world of fashion, and you've been a model mm -hmm. before, in the world of fashion, there's not, there aren't that many uh, women of color in modeling. Um, and there are, not, there are very few women who are dark skin. So she's booking campaigns which means that she's making money. Um, first, who's behind Shudu and what other, I guess, complications does this create? Right, so the person who created and who controls Shudu is white and male, which means the future is heading in a direction where people can create and control identities outside of their own ethnic groups. This doesn't inherently have to be a bad thing, but it does provide a lot of opportunity for exploitation. So in the case of Shudu, you mentioned uh, Profit, for example. Shudu represents a real black fashion model, but the income her identity generates isn't going to black women. It's going to her creator, a white man. So we are financially shutting out black women uh, from these opportunities while their identity is still being profited off of. Uh, and for me, this raises quite a few red flags. What other red flags does it raise for you? Uh, so there's the idea of one being misrepresentation. Um, Judu is designed through the lens of, of a white man's vision. So her skin tone, hairstyles, all of that, it's, it's through his version of what he finds desirable. So there's a lot of opportunity for stereotyping, appropriating and misrep misrepresentation, which marginalizes real black women. Um, and if you look at this kind of as a, as, a, as a lens to the future, you could see it playing out as a loophole for companies, right? So instead of having to invest in diversity or improve company culture, a company could just hire or create avatars instead from different ethnicities and kind of manipulate the, the relationship those groups may have with that company. Uh, so those kind of raise some red flags to me. And I think the final one is that we have to remember access to the market that creates avatars like Shudu and especially more advanced ones that will be par powered by AI. It's not equal. There are certain structural challenges that make it harder for some communities to access resources, the time, skill, the capital to build these types of avatars. So we're more likely to see some dominant cultures uh, be the creators and owners and controllers, um, again, marginal further marginalizing already con marginalized communities. AI has been around for a while now. Why do you think we're more, more concerned about it now? I think we are waking up to, we interface with it uh, a lot more. Um, I mean, social media has been a platform to kind of get these stories out a little bit faster. But I think it's, it's an intersection of us all just waking up to technology, whether it's uh, how our data is being used, which are the, what are the main companies that are kind of steering our future. We're starting to tune into that. Um, and I think it's a really good thing.
Well, we've been hearing a lot about ChatGPT, and Google has its own AI bot, uh, chatbot called uh, Bard, and shares recently um, in Alphabet, Google's parent company, sank more than 7%, knocking $100 billion off the firm's market value uh, when it answered a question incorrectly that was posted in an advert on Twitter. Um, but it still seems like an uncertain time for chatbots. What's your take? I think chatbots are going to be the future of how we largely interface with the internet and with technology. Uh, I think that they will play quite a dominant role. Um, when it comes to Google versus ChatGPT or OpenAI or, or Microsoft, I think that competition is good for, for us and mm -hmm. for consumers. Uh, it forces companies to innovate and bring, bring better products to, more accountable, to market. Yes, what does concern me with chatbots is that they aren't actually intelligent, right? They don't know what they're saying, mm -hmm. uh, and they sound incredibly scholarly, uh, but it could be complete nonsense. And when you have companies then competing uh, for a first place or to kind of be the first mover, it can get sloppy. Uh, and AI is a serious technology. It's not, it's not a joke to kind of mess around with. Uh, and so in this instance where, where Google, Google's chatbot Bard said something, you know, incorrect, if it had a lot more significance, if somebody was using that piece of information to make a critical decision with, um, then that's not so great and it's not so you know, inconsequential. You mentioned earlier about the displacement of uh, jobs. I just wanted to go through some um, information here for a second and then mm -hmm. we're going to talk about that. Uh, the World Economic Forum released a report in 2020 saying that COVID shifted the way we work. The report concluded that the workforce is automating faster than expected and that 85 million jobs will be displaced by 2025, which is now two years away. Uh, the robot revolution will create 97 million new jobs, but communities most at risk from disruption will need support from businesses and governments. Analytical thinking, uh, creativity, and flexibility among the top skills needed. Data and artificial intelligence, content creation, and cloud computing will be the top emerging professions. And the most competitive businesses will be those that reskill and upskill current employees. Is there a risk that this move towards automation won't create jobs um, more equitably? Absolutely. I think the, the fact or the point about it creating more jobs uh, is correct. I think if we look at historical trend lines, uh, technology has net-net led to, to more, more industries, new avenues. Um, but how those jobs get created, who has access to them, uh, and who is given the resources, time, and skills to pivot towards them, that can absolutely be uh, a problem in terms of, of equity. And if we look in even the last 10 years, how income has kind of been divided, mm -hmm. it isn't trending in a direction that's favorable uh, or equal. Mm -hmm. And I do think that that's something that we need to be tuning into. Do you think, though, that maybe in some ways we're kind of just um, kind of, it's going to happen if eventually, right? So should we not adjust to this uh, very real probability? Yeah, I think we the technology isn't going away. Um, our future workforce will be more augmented by it than less. Uh, so we do need to, to lean into it uh, and try to minimize the potential gaps. I think if there's anything we can learn from the Industrial Revolution uh, is that you have to take care of your society and your citizens because uh, that's where the real problem lies, when people are left kind of to fend for themselves uh, economically, uh, their purpose, and otherwise. I think we now, the result, the numbers are in. Mm -hmm. We know which direction we're headed towards. We have an opportunity to prepare people as best we can. And I think it's really important that we, we take that. Um, AI goes beyond a chatbot. Now there are tools out there that can mimic someone's voice and create images that kind of like, is, there's been times when I'm like, is this real? Is this not real? There was a recent video of Steph Curry just like, you know, hitting the, the net, like getting the basket from all over the court. And I thought it was real. It was not real. Um, <laughs> what are the concerns around that? Mm -hmm, around authenticity mm -hmm. and transparency. And even just maybe like, you know, the deep fakes that we're seeing. Right, I think uh, deep fakes present quite a critical political, geopolitical threat um, that we don't really have a solution for at this point. Uh, and the truth about deep fakes is it's not just that we are at risk of believing what's not true, 
um, but that we stop believing what is true. We come, become so disoriented in a sea of all this information uh, that we lack a critical discourse and, and direction. Uh, and I think that that's a real risk. And we have already started to see in some you know, geopolitical situations mm -hmm. deep fakes being used, um, but we were able to kind of detect that. There have been companies that have had systems or, or Microsoft has been a big, big player in kind of flagging that. Mm -hmm. But it's very much a cat mouse scenario. We don't have an actual plan. Uh, and so I do think deep fakes present quite an emerging threat. Uh, and that should be part of the, the tech education curriculum and discussion points. How do we spot these? How do we know to even look for them in the, in the first place? What about voice mimicking? Mm -hmm, that as well. I would kind of put that, so there's deep fake audio, deep fake visual. Um, I would kind of lump that all in together. Mm -hmm. um, and the technology is just further advancing. So you had men mentioned chat uh, GPT. There are similar technologies where you can take a three second clip of somebody's voice and use it to generate an entire podcast that they never were featured on. Um, and so on the one hand, it's gonna be great for creators and all of these new tools and resources. Uh, but on another end, it's the disinformation and misinformation can be produced at a fraction of the cost um, and at a fraction of, of the speed. Uh, and that I think is quite an emerging threat that we need to tune into. Um, th that's uh, very nerve wracking. Did you uh, recently, when you were talking about uh, we're talking about the mimicking of the voices, but when we talk about art, you know, art comes from a place of experience and emotion and um, someone's perspective. But recently there was um, this, uh, I guess, not controversy, but more conversation uh, about this one app that could create images of all of us that were just stunning. Uh, where, what are your thoughts about that? Like the um, AI in the spaces kind of in art and uh, creating works of poetry and literature? Mm -hmm. So I think there's definitely been a lot more uh, hesitance or kind of pushback on AI stepping into these creative realms. Uh, and for many reasons, I think up until this point, we thought creativity was something that's uniquely human. And to see it be synthesized uh, by an AI system, it's very alarming because it changes how we relate to ourselves as humans, right? Poetry, um, art, music, those are things that we think only some humans are even naturally endowed with. Mm -hmm. And to see it get passed to a machine uh, seems very jarring, um, but I think every single industry is gonna be impacted by technology uh, and the world of the arts is, is no different. And I'm looking forward to what could be unleashed uh, in an optimistic way when we all have access to creative tools. Mm -hmm. um, I do think if you are more naturally endowed with artistic skill, you could use an AI system much better uh, than somebody who can't paint or, or make music. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think it's that you know, artists go away, they can you know, adopt these tools for themselves. But I think that there will be some magic to, to happen when we all have access to these systems to help bring different types of content or creative expression to life. Is that the optimism that you were talking about, that one day possibly we would all have access to these tools? Yeah, I think um, that would be the goal, that we could all kind of have a access to them. I think, of course, there are risks that come again with, with everybody have access, having access to these types of tools. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think it could be quite a great turning point uh, for society if we use them and adopt them correctly um, and we're informed in, in how to utilize them. Well, there's been more effort on AI regulation in recent years. The AI Act in Europe, uh, those potentially concerned about chatbots being used in class assignments, et cetera. Um, what are your thoughts on regulation and reaction to emerging tech? Mm -hmm. So there is the, when it comes to ChatGPT and the recent chatbots, some schools have leaned to just ban it outright. Um, and I think we're- The schools might ban it, but the kids will find a way to use the it. The kids are gonna use it anyways. And I think we're moving in the wrong direction because the purpose of education is to prepare students for the economy of tomorrow. And that economy is gonna be largely underscored by technologies such as ChatGPT and other AI systems. So we really do need to be equipping kids uh, with not even just the skills to utilize these tools so they can actually be productive people in the economy, uh, but to utilize them safely, right? So when we have conversations around misinformation and disinformation and the risks these systems present, uh, if we're just banning them, uh, we're banning an opportunity uh, for the next generation to adopt these tools wisely uh, and steer their future in a, in a direction that they want to use it or to, for it to go, sorry. And I think most of our current education systems is, are largely 
transitioning or encouraging kids for jobs of the past, not transitioning into the jobs of the future. Uh, and that means we've got to adopt these technologies, we've got to lean into them, uh, and we have to also equip students with the skills to build them as well. To be, uh, in, in, instead of being, um, I guess, content, instead of just being the users, actually be the creators. Mm -hmm. Be the creators and, and the critical thinkers. Mm -hmm. um, when social media became a part of our lives, I think a lot of us didn't realize um, that putting so much of our personal information might come back later to bite us. Uh, parents sharing photos of their children. I've done this. and. Then I did it without consent when they were younger. Um, and if you are younger, you might share something that decades later might impact your employment. And sometimes scammers only need your email address to destroy your life. Um, should all jurisdictions be following the EU's lead with their right to be forgotten privacy law? Absolutely. I think data for many reasons. Uh, could be a national security crisis. Uh, having a bunch of having citizen data just open, uh, manipulated, accessible to not only just different companies but different countries. Uh, I think that that's a really big red flag. Uh, and then, of course, for for personal reasons, you should be, have the right to be forgotten, uh, or for a company not to be able to make a statistical prediction as to what your next moves are going to be, uh, because they've been hoarding a serious bunch of information on you uh, throughout your life. So I think the EU is definitely moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think companies would, or countries sorry, would be wise to, to follow suit. Do you think that maybe this is in part um, why some people are skeptical of AI technology and maybe this future of automation? Because it just kind of feels as if you're the user, but not you're not in control of what's happening around you. Mm -hmm. I think the the fear and kind of pessimism towards AI in the future. There's a few reasons. Some of it's pop culture related, mm -hmm. tuning into shows like Black Mirror, The Matrix. Um, but then again, yes, of course, a lot of our interactions with technology, uh, we feel like it's happening to us, uh, not with us. Mm -hmm. And for many people, it seems like there's five or six companies uh, and maybe seven or eight people kind of steering our future, uh, and that feels quite alarming. But I think if you equip people with the right information and tools to participate in creating the technologies um, that they're going to be using, I think that can change kind of the discourse and, and the direction. And at the beginning of the pandemic, work for a lot of people changed. Um, a lot of people, uh, if you were able to, you were able to work from home. Kids were learning online, as I mentioned. What would you say are the upsides to the future of work? Right. So I think the pandemic showed us who were we incorrectly excluding from the workforce because we falsely assumed that everybody had to show up nine to five, Monday to Friday. Uh, that opened up a whole new door for, for new parents or people with different mobility needs. Uh, so that was a, a kind of key shining light. Uh, I think the future of work is gonna be a lot more flexible. So we've already been moving away from the days where you work for a single company for 10 years, uh, and that trend is gonna continue. The, pandemic and, and technology showed us that flexibility can work uh, and it kind of prepared us for what more remote and more transient uh, kind of workplaces look like and I think that that is something that's that's optimistic and, and helpful. Well from your view um, I think for employees it works uh, to have a little bit of leverage now but from the perspective of the employers how are they taking that future of work? Are they adjusting well? Or are they gonna fight it maybe? Uh, I, I guess it kind of depends on the company. And I think we are adjusting well as employees, but I think we don't even fully realize what's coming. So uh, when I say more remote work, or um, and what I'm really referring to is in a world where smart machines uh, learn new tricks over time, it becomes much less likely that a company is going to hire for a full-time role if that role is going to be radically changed in the next year or two years. Uh, so we're going to see a rise of, of the gig economy uh, across all jobs. So we see a lot of, you know, whether you're a delivery you know, driver or whatnot, we'll see it across financial analysts, lawyers, physicians, teachers, uh, where we all work in kind of different roles for a few different companies at any one time. Um, and in, in terms of are we embracing that, are companies embracing that, uh, I don't think we're, we're ready yet. Uh, but I think things like remote work have been helpful in kind of laying the foundation for how those systems and infrastructures could operate. Um, a few, couple of years ago, you wrote how we need to stop asking uh, kids what they want to be when they grow up. Uh, what did you mean by that? Mm -hmm. And I know that that question is usually asked with the best intention. Uh, but the reality is most of the jobs that uh, a child would see today or, or answer that question with 
probably won't exist by the time they are in a working age or they'll be radically transformed. Uh, so instead of kind of setting people up, and it's not for, for failure, but um, for the idea that your identity is attached to the job that you do, when we know the future of work is going to be very different, we should be encouraging kids to think more broadly about the problems that they want to solve, um, because those are, are more likely to exist than a specific occupation. Um, and especially as technology continues to more rapidly disrupt the workforce, we have to move away from this idea that you are your job, um, because that's going to change. So if we can start with kids and encouraging them, you know, what are the skills that you want to learn and the problems that you want to solve? Um, and one of the most important skills for the future being critical thinking and imagination, that's something that children are already naturally endowed with. Lean into that. The curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, when you said that, I kind of felt like, oh, I think that, might, that might, that's hard for people to hear. It is, but you know, 15 years ago, the role of a social media manager analyst didn't exist. Now, if a company doesn't have one, you're probably not going to make it. Mm. Uh, so it, the trend lines aren't very different. There are significant, and you, whether you're a, a data analyst, a data scientist, all of these jobs have really come to the forefront in, in the last decade. Um, and so that's still going to continue going forward. But I think the future always seems a lot more shocking from the present, mm -hmm. and especially when we analyze it uh, through the frameworks of the present. Um, how can we empower then uh, people to embrace technology and to leverage it? I think leaning into it, you know, the, the best thing we can do about the future is prepare for it. It's not going to go away. Um, to recognize how much you already use it. I don't know about you, I can't get down the street without consulting maybe Google Maps. Uh, so we use AI. It, all of the time, social media, if you watch a streaming platform. So to know that these tools aren't as overwhelming as we might make them out to be. They're very actually easy to, to use, but it's about leaning into it, um, doing your best to try to understand it and, and keep up with the discourse with it. Um, and then of course, at, at a more societal and federal level, level, equipping people with the resources they're gonna need to thrive uh, in such a dynamic future. Sinead, it's been amazing having you here. I, I could talk to you for another hour. Thank you so much. Um, continued success to you. Thank, Thank you. you, all mm -hmm. the best. It's hard to fix problems when you don't have a clear picture of what's wrong. That's where Hamilton's housing and homelessness dashboard comes in. With us now to explain how it's being used, from the hammer, Justin Chandler, who covers Hamilton Niagara for Ontario Hubs. Hey, Justin. Hey there. All right, so let's take a step back before we get into this dashboard, hoping you can sort of tell us generally, what's the state of housing in Hamilton right now? Well, uh, it's uh, real expensive, I think is probably the best way to put it. Um, one of my friends is a reporter at the Hamilton Spectator, and she just uh, put out a piece uh, just a couple of weeks back saying that, you know, for people in the city, only something like 12% of apartments are affordable if uh, you're making under 45000 which uh, is the, the median income for a single household in Hamilton is right around 40000 So you can imagine there are a lot of people in the city uh, who just can't afford rent, um, who can't find a good place to live. The asking price for a one-bedroom rent now, the average, according to Rentals.ca, is pushed up over uh, 1700 a month. Mm. So really, just uh, Hamilton is not uh, the affordable place that it used to be. All right, before we look at some specific numbers, what does the Hamilton Housing and Homelessness Dashboard help determine? So the Hamilton and Homelessness uh, Housing Dashboard, the way that uh, this works is it's uh, data put up by the city. And this is uh, so that uh, the public can look at this, advocates can look at this, uh, decision makers can look at it. Um, and it's a way of showing if the city's meeting need. So it shows that, you know, how many people in the city are unhoused. It shows how many people are waiting for affordable housing. What is the average uh, actual rent that people are paying? So it's really a way of uh, tracking all this information and presenting it. All right, so let's dig into the numbers. We have a graphic here that shows what a dashboard would look like. As of December 2022, 142 people became newly homeless, while 336 people moved into housing or timed out of the system. 1,509 people were actively unhoused, but the shelter bed capacity sits at 515, and people housed through city-funded programs was 345. I want to get to that top uh, little stat there, monthly inflow and outflow. Explain a little more about that. 
Yes, and I'll just say apologies for uh, the wind in the background. It's uh, getting pretty blustery over here in the hammer. Uh, so inflow means the number of people that are coming into contact with uh, the housing homelessness system. Outflow means uh, people who are leaving contact. Um, so generally what you want is high outflow and low inflow. Uh, so outflow could mean that somebody has uh, been housed, maybe they're receiving a housing supplement, or it also might mean that uh, in the last three months they haven't been in contact uh, with the shelter or the uh, the housing system so that maybe just uh, city staff haven't heard from them in a while. So it might not mean that they, you know, have an apartment, but maybe they're staying with a friend or something like that. Now, from that data set, it looks like actively unhoused people far outnumber the shelter beds available uh, or the capacity, rather. What does that mean for people who are looking for shelter in that city? Uh, it unfortunately means that a lot of people are out of luck. It means that uh, someone might get to a shelter and it's full. Um, it means that warming centers, um, which we've talked about on the show before, uh, become really important because people need a place to stay overnight. Uh, however, you know, a lot of warming centers are also filling up, so people will have to take turns in order to get in there. Uh, really, it means that as a city, we're not meeting the need. We don't have enough uh, space and enough shelter for all the people who need it. And lastly, there was about 345 people accessing city-funded programs. Give us a sense of what that number actually means. Right. So this could be, uh, you know, something like um, uh, uh, shelter, um, drop-in, um, rent supplements, uh, just people who are, who are getting uh, some sort of assistance uh, from the city uh, in order to, uh, to be housed. All right. Now, behind those numbers are people who are looking for housing and those who are trying to find those people housing as well. What did homelessness policy and programs manager for the city of Hamilton tell you about sort of that, that aspect? Yes, what uh, Nadia Zalisco was saying is that really it's important to remember that uh, these statistics represent people. Um, and that's just, uh, I think, a good thing to, to keep in mind when we're talking about this. You know, you might see, oh, th this number's going down or this number's going up, but then you think it, it represents that many hundreds of our neighbors. Um, and that's a, a really important thing to keep in mind whenever we're talking about uh, housing and affordability um, is that this is, uh, you know, people who maybe cannot afford a, a place to live. Um, and you know, it's tracking their interactions with, with a system. So this is a very uh, human-based um, system, and uh, you know, we need to keep that in mind. These, these numbers represent need. Do we have an understanding of how the city of Hamilton will react to said numbers if the inflow and the outflow um, are sort of you know, at capacity when we're looking at the number of shelter beds? Um, is, does the city respond to these numbers or is this simply looked at as a monitor system? The, the city is trying to uh, to respond to these. There's recognition. Uh, you know, you listen to council meetings uh, and talk about uh, homelessness programs, and there is recognition at an official level in the city that um, we we can't meet everybody's needs. Like they're they're not debating these numbers. Um, so it, it's part monitoring, but it's also part of saying what can we do um, to help. Uh, the thing, of course, that it then comes to is what uh, what are we willing to do? And you know, the, just because the numbers are showing this, it, there also has to be political will in order for for changes to happen. And there's a lot of a lot of people in the city uh, who would say we're doing everything we can. And there's a lot of uh, people looking uh, at it also who would say no, you're not. And there's there's more that we could be doing. So there's there's certainly debate there. Now, Nadia, the expert you spoke to, also mentioned that there is a systemic overrepresentation of Indigenous people uh, looking for housing. Uh, how is that being addressed in the city of Hamilton as well? Yeah, so this is, uh, I mean, that's a big question, right? It could almost be its, its, its own story. Mm -hmm. But as far as what I can... Uh, can say uh, just for now is that uh, there is work uh, with Indigenous leaders in the city, uh, working with the city in order to uh, apportion resources and uh, direct programs. Uh, Nadia Zalisco was telling me how um, you know there's examples of how the city's worked with leaders to better survey people and actually um, identify the scope of uh, this overrepresentation, finding that you know something like 23% of unhoused people. Um, are indigenous, even though that's about 3% of the city's population. Um, and then there are a lot of uh, groups and advocates who are trying to push uh, to better help people and uh, address this problem. Um, 
And yeah, you know, there's uh, plenty of work that uh, certainly needs to keep going on there. And that's uh, something that uh, community members in the city are regularly saying is that this is a, a big problem. And uh, that aspect of it is, uh, is a problem that we need to keep looking at too. A really important story. Justin Chandler, thank you so much for your reporting and joining us on the program tonight. Take care. The agenda this week debated sports betting in the province, asked if artificial intelligence could be on the verge of becoming conscious, and assessed the track record of international human rights enforcement. The agenda's week in review begins with the bombshell story of Toronto's mayor declaring his intent to resign. I don't care if I'm loved. I don't care if people think I'm exciting. I just care that people respect me and that they respect the job that I'm trying to do in terms of working hard to and working together with other governments to get things done. All right, let's talk legacy. If this, in fact, is the end of John Tory's mayoralty and potentially political career, how does the city remember him? Look, when I ran for mayor, um, John Tory then already had a problem, which was um, when you asked a person on the street what they thought of John and Tory, they generally liked him. They thought he was a good man. Um, they liked that he was out in the community, that he was showing up. And then when you ask them, what has he done, uh, it dried up pretty quickly. And so my understanding was that this third term was about a legacy, legacy building opportunity in the absence of that having happened over the past eight years. And I should say that he came out of the gate really, really hard with a very bold housing plan just last month that had a lot of the elements that many of us housing advocates have been pushing for for many years. So he was kind of poised to actually to actually do it. Like he, it felt like he was on the cusp of doing the things we were hoping he would he would do. The challenge is that just got cut really short. So I'm not sure where that leaves us. Here's documentary filmmaker Barry Averich. Uh, writing in the Toronto Sun exactly three years ago. Uh, here's what he had. Sheldon, let's bring this up. I have enormous respect for him, John Tory, and I know he is working hard, but it would be great if one of the best mayors Toronto has had in a long time actually had a memorable legacy beyond showing up to everything and avoiding a scandal. Mm -hmm. Sabrina, I mean, this echoes a bit of what Jennifer Kiesmatt just had to say. What do you look at when you point to a Tory legacy as mayor? I think, unfortunately, there won't be much of one after this. He, um, when we're talking about should he continue on, I don't think he's had such a stellar legacy or impact on this city that someone else can't step into the job and um, govern going forward. We look at housing, we look at violence, we look at public transit, like garbage being collected on the street. By almost every measure, we've seen a huge amount of decline over the last nine years. Now, understandably, after the Ford era, People wanted someone who was stable, who was boring, for lack of a better word, who would be uneventful. But I would argue we got into this little bit of a rut that the city didn't know how to get out of. And that's not John Tory's fault, per se. People knew who they were voting for and what they were voting for. But perhaps this could be an opportunity for a new start. Marcus, legacy? I think people may be kinder in retrospect to John Tory than they are now. I mean, this was a very dramatic and, and uh, unfortunate end. But uh, first of all, in his first term, he did successfully return stability and integrity to, to uh, the city of Toronto after this terrible scandal we went through. Um, and he started working with other governments. Uh, he was much better at that than his predecessor. In his second term, there was COVID. And he was actually a superb leader of this city during COVID. He, he told everybody, go out and get vaccinated. He led this, along with Joe Cressy, the city councillor, led this uh, push to get out into the most disadvantaged communities and uh, work with community organizations to get people vaccinated. He was a steady hand at the tiller. So I think that's a substantial legacy there. He obviously had it, Ben, as a huge priority to get along 
with provincial leaders, with federal leaders, and managed to get billions of dollars out of those senior levels of government to put towards projects in the city of Toronto. Mm -hmm. Does he get credit for that? I think he should to, to some extent. Um, I think, you know, I think one of the things that's, that's so, um, you know, if you're a supporter of Tory is, is lamentable here is that he, he had also launched this campaign or said he was about to launch this campaign to win a new fiscal deal for cities, right? To negotiate with the other levels of government to make cities more financially sustainable. And that is the kind of bold um, campaign that, that we hadn't seen from him in the first two terms in office. So, um, you know, it would have been really interesting to watch how that played out and how successful um, he, he would have been in that. And now, of course, we'll, we'll never know. One of the things that I heard said, though, was that when Rob Ford, for example, went on the road as the mayor of Toronto, if he had to travel to Los Angeles to meet people in the film business, or if he had to go to the United Kingdom or whatever to try to drum up business, people often were nervous and even embarrassed about what he might do. Mm -hmm. You never worried when John Tory represented the city abroad. Is that fair to say? I, I think that that's probably fair to say. I mean, he, his whole brand, of course, is, is uh, as we've been saying, this kind of upstanding, um, you know, respectable person. Um, and I and I think that, um, that that's why uh, it's been, you know, people are shocked at his resignation. But I think I think to some extent you can understand when his whole brand was this idea uh, of him being uh, kind of buttoned down and upright, and uh, all of a sudden that's kind of gone in one one fell swoop, and you can see that he just didn't want to stick around to, to kind of tough it out. Well, let me pick up on that. Do, do the events of the last 72 hours, Jennifer, negate whatever achievements he may have had over the previous eight plus years, ultimately, at the end of the day? I don't know. I'm struggling with the conversation because, uh, you know, I was asked this the other day, is this bad for the brand of the city? And all I could think was what's bad for the brand of the city is people being afraid to go on the TTC. What's banned, bad for the brand of the city is the fact that we have seen an absolute crisis in homelessness in this city. What's br bad for the brand of the city is that the garbage bins are overflowing and broken mm. and the, the parks are falling apart. Like, you know, so I'm struggling a little bit because uh, I think that if, you know, on most of the measures, you know, we haven't even talked about the potholes and the state of the, the roads mm -hmm. in this city because there's been a lack of investment in very basic infrastructure. Do you think there is adequate attention by the gaming association, by the industry itself, to ensure that there are not a plethora of ads on the air and that they do remind you to gamble responsibly. Yeah, well, the Gaming Association has been clear on this um, before, but I think it's up to us as a regulator under the Canadian Broadcasting Act and as well. It was one of the weaknesses of the legislation was that we just basically devolved it to the province, and we knew that from the get-go. Uh, it's still a better situation um, that we've had in the past. Um, you know, so the Ontario Lottery Gaming Commission, they do have all those checks and balances that Paul mentions. Uh, when you sign in, you actually have to be in the country or the province as well, too. Um, but what I'm concerned about is during the game itself, the heightened experience of trying to affect a person's behavior just to watch that event. And I think that's a little bit different than, you know, another commercial. Um, this is an ongoing experience. And what I'm worried about right now is that we should be walking, um, not running towards uh, this experience. And so I'd like to see, and some leagues have been great in terms of uh, less of a reaction. The NHL, for example, is very aggressive on this. Um, they're even using current athletes, which I think are compromised individuals uh, to promote um, events. Whereas others have kind of, you know, stayed back and played it a little bit more um, uh, related to the, you know, I guess their traditions of, of not being as influencers during the game. And that's what I, I'm concerned about. Chelsea, can I get you to comment on the advertising? Because I know that probably most of us have seen those ads with Wayne Gretzky and um, and Connor McDavid, which are, frankly, I mean, they're good ads. They're quite funny. They certainly let you know what the product is. Uh, but I guess there's a question of whether or not the saturation amount is too much and what you think of them. Well, I think that by including celebrities, it creates this normalization of the gambling behavior as this is part and parcel to the sports watching experience now, for example. And we know that when activities such as gambling um, are more accessible and the exposure goes up and therefore they're more normalized, there you may see an increase of problematic gambling behaviors. So I can speak for our organization that many of our clients will use the terms, you know, this, it's inescapable, right? I, I can't look anywhere. I can't go anywhere without 
without being triggered. And when I say being triggered, that means triggering the strong urge to gamble. So it's very tough out there for some of our clients to maintain their sobriety in this particular climate. I understand that, but then let me do this follow-up. What percentage of people would you be talking about who are watching a game who might be triggered by seeing an ad? I wouldn't have that data necessarily. I don't think anybody has that data per se because this is so new. I can just speak to the majority of our sports gamblers that we see here at Problem Gambling at uh, Hotel Du Grace Healthcare that uh, we, we speak about high risk situations when we're trying to work out a recovery plan. And we say, you know, try to avoid these external triggers as best you can. And with this increase in ads, it is becoming a little more difficult to do that naturally because it is almost everywhere that they, that they look at this point. Well, let me take that up with Deirdre then. If, if you've got, let's say, 5 or 10% of the people watching any particular game who have a problem being triggered, are we really saying that we should be canceling all advertising if 90% are doing it, 95% are doing it just fine? <laughs> well, actually, it, it's interesting that we're talking about this because in the United States, the, um, the ICRG, the International Council on Responsible Gambling, has put out a call for a center for excellence on studying advertising and gambling mm -hmm. to find out for sure what is the impact, right? We don't know. Right? We don't. No. You don't and have numbers either. We, it, we, have, we do not. Mm -hmm. And so all we have, Chelsea and myself, is this anecdotal evidence that it's different, that it's changed, that it feels oppressive, that it feels like you can't just do your normal activities without this inundation of ads. And so, uh, you know, my hope is that Ontario will also follow suit and do these kinds of studies. It's really mm -hmm. important to know what exactly is happening with people before we make decisions about what to do. Paul. Yeah. No, and that's exactly right. And Flutter International, which is a company, the parent company of FanDuel and Poker Stars, is actually with the Responsible Gaming Council here in Canada, is funding a study to look at advertising because we do want to learn. There is a news. That's really what the new part is. The gambling activities have been accessible to Ontarians mm -hmm. uh, before and after all of this. They've because the internet was there and available to anybody who wanted to use it without many of the controls that are now in place. Do you have a sense about what percentage of people have a problem with gambling who are watching these games? I, not watching the games, but we know in the population that the, the rates of severe problem gambling can, depending on jurisdiction, range from a half percent to one and a half percent. And then there's others that have control problems that may be episodic mm -hmm. in many ways. Um, and, and there is an understanding of that player, but what is advertising? And we, because we have had, as we said, we've had the gaming advertising. Do we have more? Yes. But it's, you know, in terms of, because it's different. And the activity is, is now creating these companies legal and regulated. With that comes the ability to provide advertising. You cannot answer these questions just from looking at the behavior of the machine. You have to understand what's it inside but i also agree with melanie here I, that uh, I, I think uh, robert went a little far when he categorically dismissed that machines can understand or, or be conscious because frankly yeah i am a blob of quarks and electrons that are processing information in a certain way and and so are all these ai systems and i think it's carbon chauvinism to assume that somehow you can only have true understanding or in sentience if you're made of carbon, I think what we've learned is that actually it's, it doesn't matter whether you're made of carbon or silicon or some other kind of atom. It's, it's just the information processing that matters. Robert, and you want to take another shot at shutting this do, down? So can machines, uh, actually. Uh, yeah, sure can. We, talk, we talked about, um, first of all, creativity. And um, computers, I, I believe, if you if you look at them right, or ha don't have the ability to be creative. Uh, what what Lemoyne is doing is judging a book by its cover. This follows the the idea that Max is talking. One needs to look under the hood to see what's happening. And one of the great tests for for creativity was proposed by Summer Bringshort at Rensselaer, which says that a computer will be creative when it uh, does something that is beyond the explanation or the intent of the original programmer. I maintain that GPT, which was recently labeled by Noam Chomsky as high tech uh, plagiarism, uh, is is not indeed creative. It's synthesizing a bunch of a bunch of stuff. And uh, often I've gotten answers from GPT-3. And if you Google some of the great responses that it has, um, you find out that, yeah, it's it, it's on the Web. So it borrowed it from somewhere. So um, I don't believe 
and this is an arguable point, but I don't believe there's any case of a computer or AI passing the Lovelace test and demonstrating that it is truly creative like a human can be. Well, Melanie, let's try this. If an artificial intelligence were actually conscious, how would we know? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if there's any good test that will tell you if something is conscious or not. You know, that's, as Max said earlier, you know, we've argued for millennia as to whether animals are conscious or even certain, um, you know, plants or other structures. And, you know, and we no one agrees on whether these things are conscious. We don't have a rigorous test. But I think that we all probably agree that consciousness does require the notion of experience. It requires the notion of having a sense of yourself, that you have kind of a model in your brain of that you, that, that you are an entity, that you have feelings, that you have emotions, that there is a you there. And we know that language models like ChatGPT or GPT-3 or Lambda don't have that. They don't have that kind of model of themselves as an entity. They don't have experiences. They are computing probabilities over the next words or phrases in language. So I think we can very confidently say that these systems are not conscious, but we don't have a rigorous test to sort of prove that. And that's been a philosophical argument for forever, you know, since the early days uh, when people even started thinking about consciousness. Look at Syria. Look at if I'm a Uyghur in China, if I'm a, a, a Syrian who has been bombed or jailed or uh, brutally killed by my regime, or if I'm in Africa or uh, some other country and, and simply the police not a systematic effort, but the police on a daily basis violate my rights. What is human rights doing for those people? And those people are in the billions. We're talking a quarter, a third, a half of humanity uh, knows nothing about these rights and are not being helped by these rights. Samuel, those are pretty profound questions. How would you answer them? I think human rights uh, movements have done well when they've done well in targeting relatively weaker actors like African despots and warlords. But uh, George W. Bush and Vladimir Putin, uh, who helm great powers and have done far more damage to the world, have been let off the hook. I agree completely that the greatest successes are in relatively more democratic countries that decide to have human rights as part of their domestic law. And then human rights can become about citizens' movements challenging their states from within, and their successes can be extraordinary. Let's pick up on some of those names. Farida, do you imagine for a moment that Vladimir Putin worries about what the international human rights movement thinks about what he's doing? I think he does. I he mean, does. I think when you see the targeted sanctions that have been put in place where Canada, in addition to other countries, have imposed widespread asset freezes on a number of high-level Russian officials. Um, they can't really travel freely anymore. Their assets are frozen. There's certainly, you know, it, it's not unfathomable to imagine a situation where President Putin would find himself in the International Criminal Court. And so we've seen, with, you, with respect to Ukraine, there has been, the, you know, all of the tools in the toolbox have been used, right? We talk about targeted sanctions, an international criminal court uh, referral, um, you know, resettlement for Ukrainian ref refugees. So it's really, despite the abuses on the ground, there is more of a spotlight on the human rights situation in Ukraine and the perpetrators than ever before. And so that, I think, is a win. And, you know, Seth mentioned Syria, for example. Yes, are we seeing that, you know, 11 years into the war, uh, abuses remain? 
Absolutely. But at the same time, you've seen a number of wins, even over the past year, where a court in Germany, for the very first time, actually in a landmark victory, tried a Syrian official for widespread torture. This was using the international human rights movement, um, you know, a mechanism called universal jurisdiction, which means that any, any country, even if the abuses didn't take place in that country, even if the victims are not from that country, can pursue justice for the, the the most serious international crimes. And that's what German courts are doing, Syri the um, Swedish courts are doing, in order to pursue justice where it's been closed off. Well, let me follow up with Seth on that. Do you think Bashar al-Assad or Xi Jinping worry about the international human rights movement when they are doing the horrors that they are doing? I mean, what they will do, because today there are so many rights that are talked about, they will come up and say that we're, um, we're helping our societies develop economically. This is especially the Chinese case. We're offering social services to our people. And so they can look at the long list of rights that are promoted today, and they can say, we're doing a lot of these, and actually you, you democratic countries in the West, you're not, you have people who have homeless, you have people who are poor. So when we make rights about everything, these authoritarian regimes can turn around and say they're doing a better job than we are. We're forgetting the history of these successes. The history of these successes uh, were achieved because they focused on a small number of rights, uh, religious and freedom, conscious freedom, to think as you want, to say what you want, due process, uh, rule of law. When we forget the basic rights that, that won these battles and we focus on everything, the authoritarian regimes not only are not scared, but they turn around and use rights against us. Sandra, what do you think of that characterization? Yeah, I mean, I think what he's saying there is just that perhaps you're diluting rights by by expanding them or you're picking and choosing. But I think I think if you look at what happens in the international system, you know, it tends to be that rights are reflected from the international society and reflect what is of concern to the international society. And so, you know, that this is a consensual system. I think we have to remember that this is a system of law. It's sort of a rule of law framework whereby states are can choose how to protect you know individuals and their human rights and individuals have access to institutions and mechanisms whereby they can protect their rights if their national system fails to that's just some of what we've covered this week you can find more including the full conversations on our website tvo.org our youtube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda or our twitter feed twitter.com slash the agenda and that's it for this friday february 17th 2023 trouble in families can lead to deep divisions and even estrangement monday we'll find out why that's apparently on the rise i'm jay and thanks for watching tvo and for joining us online at tvo.org have a great family day weekend and Steve will see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. never have been a police officer. If he would associate with drug dealers then, what was he doing when he was wearing a uniform in between? Welcome to the amazing story of Corey Pegues. For 21 years, I was able to hide the fact of my previous life. That's how we grew up. We was right in the middle of crime. But this is not your ordinary urban drama. It's a great escape. I'm leaving all of this. Get out of here. There's no way that you're going to be a cop. But he was able to say, you know what? I can do that. I'm going to know how to make an arrest because I'm going to know what they're doing out there. I can make a difference in people's lives.
Just look at the climate in America and minority communities and their dealings with the police. You can try to change the system. He was real and he was sincere. But sometimes the system fights back. I knew it was going to be a lot of backlash. Should I have been stuck in the street where most people want you to be where you're on the lower end of the totem pole and not given a second chance? A cops and robbers story, tomorrow at 9. have an impossible battle. As a collective, we stand a chance. Small Acts, continuing Sunday at 9.